Bayesian learning in the last lecture, and we're going to continue this, and we're going to continue this for the next few weeks. Um, so, uh, just a mild, mild uh, reminder: uh, we are getting to the end of the semester, and there will be a final exam. And there's a date for the final exam on the website. It's is it 16? 16. It's 16. There's a time. Anyway, there's a time on the website. Um, and it will happen here, and I'll keep reminding you, but just wanted to give you a heads up. And uh, at somewhere around that time, the, the project reports will also be due. Right now, the schedule on the website says the project reports are due on the last day of class. Uh, but last year, I remember there was a popular demand that the project reports be made due on the last day of the exams. Um, and I don't care either way. Um, I've always thought that having it due on the last day of the exams means that you guys will not have enough time to study for exams. But, uh, you know, I can move that if... The how many people... The demand is still there. Well, there's <laughs> one person claiming popular demand. <laughs> okay, uh, so most likely I'll just move the project deadline to the last day of the exam. You're, uh, you're welcome to submit it before. I mean, uh, the submission will be as always. And you should hear back from me on uh, your... Uh, intermediate reports sometime soon. I know it's uh, been a while since you submitted, so I'm hoping that all the feedback I give you is late, uh, and you've already finished all the things that I hope you would have finished. Yes? How many more homeworks do we have? Just one more. Uh, yes, there's only one more homework, and uh, it will be covering all the stuff that we are doing today and uh, the next couple of weeks. Um, it, you should be uh, getting the homework uh, by either late today or early tomorrow morning. And uh, instead of the usual two weeks, I'll give you, I'm planning to give you another extra three or four days because it's a Thanksgiving break in the middle and you know you guys should be celebrating by doing homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, so anyway, and uh, the homework will be about uh, the probabilistic models. In particular, you'll be implementing logistic regression. In fact, this time we're gonna have some fun in the homework. You'll be deriving logistic regression stochastic gradient descent and implementing it. Um, it might sound like bad news, but the fact is, actually you, I can assure you that you've pretty much written the entire thing when you implemented your SVM. It's literally just a change in four lines of the code. Um, so that should be fun. Um, and uh, uh, are there any other questions about, yes? The syllabus for finance will be um, from where after we Right, so it will be, okay, let me give you the official line and the unofficial line. Uh, the official version is that the, mid, the final exam will only cover things that, came, that were not covered for the midterm. So, you know, thing, basically learning theory and after that. That's the official version of the story. But the fact is, you know, if I ask you about k-nearest neighbors, I may not say, you know, ask you like, extensive details, but Things like, does k nearest neighbors uh, have, uh, say, infinite VC dimension? Is that a k nearest neighbors question or a learning theory question? So, the nature of the class is it builds on top of um, what we did before. So, there may be some, I won't say accidental, but some uh, you know, stuff that comes from the earlier section. And the other interesting part is, for example, we've been talking about the perceptron algorithm and about how perceptron is really minimizing perceptron loss. But when we saw the algorithm, it was actually uh, in the beginning of the semester. So there might be some, uh, you know, stuff from the beginning, but largely things that came after learning theory. So the format of final exam is similar to Roughly, yes. And uh, I don't want to, you know, worry you about the final or anything. Just wanted to give you a heads up. I think we have enough time. Uh, or I hope we do. Uh, but just giving you a heads up. Any questions about any of these things or homeworks and any logistical aspects? Right. So uh, let's uh, continue where we left off. We were talking about Bayesian learning. And the way I presented the story, Bayesian learning is another way of answering the question, how do I, how do I pick a good hypothesis? It is uh, it's basically asking, in general learning is to find the best, the, the 
fundamental problem of learning is to find the best hypothesis given a data. And we've been looking at different definitions of best. And the uh, key idea in Bayesian learning is you use principles from probability theory to define the idea of best. And uh, this one fundamental idea that we will keep applying all the time is the Bayes rule. Um, in particular, for Bayesian learning, we'll be applying Bayes rule by treating data sets and hypotheses as random variables. So you're given a data set, the blue D here, and uh, you have to somehow rank functions. And we define best as the most probable hypothesis given the data set. And because the hypothesis, hypotheses and data sets are random variables, we can apply Bayes' rule. So the, probabil the probability of any hypothesis, the probability of some <coughs> hypothesis, the hypothesis that generated the data set, is simply the, the product of the prior, prior probability of the hypothesis and the likelihood. So we spoke about, uh, we looked at this idea of prior and posterior and such things. So the prior probability of the hypothesis is just, what is the uh, probability that this is the function? And you have no information from the data set that pushes you towards preferring one function rather than the other. It's just your prior belief. Uh, when I say your prior belief, it will, all of these will be replaced with models. All of these will uh, be uh, replaced with mathematical expressions that actually quantify that prior belief. And then there's the other aspect, which is data-driven, which says, if this function h is the one that generated the data, what is the probability that this particular instance of the data set was observed? And that's called the likelihood. The likelihood is simply asking, what is the probability of the data set given a certain hypothesis? And the Bayes rule tells us that the prior, the posterior probability of a hypothesis given a data set is simply, is proportional to the likelihood, the product of the likelihood and the prior. Okay? And we saw some aspect, some version of this uh, in the previous uh, lecture. And I want to remind you that we'll be using the Bayes rule over functions, we'll be using the Bayes rule over instances. If we can find random variables, the first thing we'll try is to apply Bayes rule. Uh, really, there are like two or three principles of probability that keep repeating all over the time. Um, there's uh, Bayes rule, and then there is this idea that of uh, conditional independence. We see conditional independence in a while. So the, uh, the way to find uh, under this way of uh, this style of defining learning, we'll say the best hypothesis is the most probable hypothesis. And the most probable hypothesis is simply the hypothesis that maximizes the posterior probability. So this gives us a condition, a criterion for learning, which is called maximum a posteriori learning. Uh, it's just, I think it's Latin for maximize the posterior probability. And it's uh, uh, abbreviated into map. So we could, this is called map learning. And we just saw by Bayes rule, the posterior probability is a product of the prior uh, and the likelihood. And there's this term P of D that keeps, uh, that should be there. And why did I drop it off in the last time? It's going to be maximized. It doesn't affect the maximum. It doesn't affect the maximum. Yes, because it doesn't have any dependence on H. Exactly. So P of D is independent of H. And if you have two hypotheses, uh, the denominator is going to be the same. And if you all you care about is the R max, not the actual max value, you don't have to compute the probability of the data set. It doesn't matter. So map, hypoth map learning is simply learning by maximizing the product of the likelihood and the prior of uh, these hypotheses. So that gives us the map uh, condition. Okay, so and I think this is where we stopped in the last lecture. So before we go ahead, are there any questions about a just general idea of Bayesian learning about map hypothesis and how this connects to other things? Well, being, I don't know what it means. Okay, uh, 
that's a very informal statement. Um, generally, what it means is that you have you you treat things as random variables, and so for example, Bayesian um, learning would say that my hypothesis is a random variable, so I'm going to introduce some prior as well, and I'm going to apply the Bayes rule and use something like this. Uh, you in the very often being Bayesian is used in a loose way, so I don't like using that phrase, so I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to, unless it's, uh, there's, I'm not, yeah, let's just say I'm not going to say what it means. It's there in the Bayesian learning basics, like, so we can be Bayesian about other things like uh, hyperparameters. Right, in, in fact, if you want to be, ba being Bayesian is something like, you can be, uh, you can say that I don't know what the, this, the correct value of this thing is. I don't know what the best value is, so let me integrate it away, or let me sum it away by uh, treating it as a random variable and just kind of finding the, and, and condition it away. Or, you know, do something like this. Basically, you introduce priors over, you. I could be introducing priors over the hyperparameter, then you'll have probability of h given hyperparameter times probability of hyperparameter and things like that. Yes? Why do we want to find the most probable hypothesis? Uh, go on. Why I think the most probable is not true. What? Oh, you know what? That's like a very good question. In fact, what we care about is not the most probable hypothesis. What we care about is something called the Bayes optimal classifier. We'll get there in a minute. It turns out the Bayes optimal classifier is impossible to find, except in the most trivial cases. Um, yeah, uh, hold on to the thought for like about 30 minutes and when we come to Bayes optimal, maybe the question will get answered. So for now I'm just saying that this is one way of asking what is the best classifier. And uh, there is a slight simplification of this. If you don't really have any prior, or prior uh, beliefs over the hypothesis, if for all functions th you think they are all equally likely, then probability of H is a uniform distribution. And if it's a uniform distribution, it doesn't really figure into the maximization as well. So you can throw that away. And that gives us something called the maximum likelihood estimate. The maximum, maximum likelihood estimate is a special case of map learning where you believe that the priors are uniform. Another way of thinking about it is maximum li likelihood learning is simply learning by maximizing the likelihood of having generated this data set. Which, so you effectively, the last line here, what you're asking is, I'm going to search over the space of hypothesis and ask which hypothesis, for each hypothesis, what is the probability that that hypothesis has generated the data set that I'm given? And use the one that has the highest probability, uh, use the one that has the highest probability of the data. Yes. Is this identical to the statistical idea of maximum likelihood? Yes. So even in like frequentist statistics? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, but uh, yes, I'm uh, sort of, yes, let's say yes. Yes. Uh, which data? Uh, the, uh, because sometimes this do not show up. Right. Um, the nice thing about Bayesian mm -hmm. learning is that it gives a very, very clean way of thinking about missing data. You can, if you have missing labels or missing features, I could just pretend that this is another random variable and, uh, I mean, it is another random variable and I can just condition it away. I can integrate it out. And now the maximization, I'm not, this, what I have said, this maximization, I've just stated a problem. Typically when you get missing data, then the, maximization becomes more difficult. The computational complexity very, very quickly often uh, becomes problematic. But uh, the, one of the nicest uh, things about Bayesian learning is it gives a very clean way of thinking about missing data. Uh, of course, if your entire data set is missing, if you do not have any examples, uh, map learning still has a way, has imposes a preference over functions. Because the prior tells you, if Probably, if D is empty, then in map learning, you can say just pick the one that has the most prior uh, probability. Whereas in maximum likelihood, well, you have nothing. 
but there are more, uh, there's more to say about missing data. Other questions? It could be anything. I mean, as, so far I've said nothing about what the hypothesis. So this is just a very, very big umbrella, uh, umbrella under which you know everything that we saw could be plugged in. So I could think of hypothesis as, for example, linear classifier. I could think of the hypothesis space as I don't know decision tree. For any hypothesis space, I could come up. I I can write down these equations. It doesn't matter what what capital H is. This still holds. What we will see, for example, when we go to say logistic regression, this hypothesis space is actually the set of linear classifiers. And you have to specify, when, when you're doing Bayesian learning, you have to specify what is the hypothesis space, what is the functional form of the prior. Because you know, for every hypothesis, it has to produce a number. You need a function. And what is the functional form of this likelihood? We need to specify those three things. And the second and the third, the functional forms of the likelihood and of the likelihood in particular is very often called uh, coming up with a model. Basically, we have to define what is the model that we believe has generated the data. So, the, one of the reasons uh, MAP is, uh, maximum likelihood is preferred is sometimes, I say often but actually sometimes, uh, it's computationally easier to do maximum likelihood learning than map learning. Okay, so all I have said now is here's a criterion for picking a hypothesis. Let me introduce what I call a brute force learner. And this is an algorithm that nobody should implement. What you should do is search over the entire hypothesis space. For every function, you calculate this value and pick the one that has the highest posterior probability. Um, obviously, there are problems with that algorithm because uh, you can't search over, for example, if your hypothesis space is a set of all linear classifiers, there's no hope for search. So, the reason I introduced the brute force uh, classifier is just to point out that in mo most of the time, except for the simplest case, uh, you might end up having to either try to do some, um, uh, use some optimization algorithm in the general case, or sometimes if you're very lucky, uh, you can compute analytical solutions to this argmax. Just, you can derive the solution for the most likely uh, classifier. And we'll see examples of both of these. In fact, uh, for naive Bayes, for example, you can actually, you can frame learning as uh, a maximum likelihood. And in general, what happens is it just becomes, you can derive the solution on paper. So the learning algorithm is entirely just it reduces to counting. But we'll see that uh, in a bit. But uh, are there any questions about the level framework before we move on to some examples? Right. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, one of the key things to do in uh, Bayesian learning is we have to make more assumptions about the probability distribution uh, about the generative model for the data. What probability distribution do you believe generated a particular data set and only then can you move on? So we'll be looking at a few examples. Uh, in particular, I'll look at uh, binomial and the normal distribution. And just to make my life easier, I'm going to do maximum likelihood estimation. We can always throw in priors uh, later. So all we need to do to define maximum likelihood estimation is we need to define the hypothesis space and define for a function, for a hypothesis, how was the data generated. And let me give you a simple example, which it may seem like it's not even learning. Okay? And let's just pretend that it's kind of a toy setting where uh, some, someone hires you for some consulting job and uh, I don't know, what, what are they making? They're making beads. And they have to decide whether uh, somehow you have to help them figure out whether their wheat production is um, good or not. And uh, you, the first question you should ask is, are they all identical? In the sense, are they 
when I say identical, the, is are they identical from the probabilistic sense, in the sense of are they all IID, independent and identically distributed, but we'll see that in a minute. So, at this point, you don't have any data, you just have a setup, and the process that generates data is called an experiment, and let's do an experiment. And we need to know if uh, these things shatter, so you just drop a few from some feet, say five of them, and you find that three of them break and two don't, and you just tell the, you report the fee, uh, that probability of failure is 0.6. Why? Why is the probability of failure 0.6? That's the maximum. Yeah, but given this thing. Because the smaller distribution is representative of the No, I mean, I'm not asking you for <coughs> fancy answers. You have, you've done five trials. Three of them fail, two of them don't. Three divided by five is 0.6. That's the easy answer. <laughs> now, in the grand scheme of uh, machine learning, let's try to make this more difficult. <laughs> so, let's say that the probability of failure is p. And clearly, that means the probability of success is 1 minus p. And remember that question that you asked, are they all identical? That becomes important. Every trial is independent and identically distributed. And now you have a set of outcomes, set of trials. So you five uh, experiments and three of them are break and two of them safe. So the probability of the data given p. Now, if you chose p, if you have a value of p, you have the hypothesis here. The hypothesis space is a set of all numbers <coughs> from 0 to 1, because that's basically what p can be. Your hypothesis space is a set of all numbers from 0 to 1, and given a hypothesis, meaning given a value of p, you can say that the probability of the data is uh, what's p cubed times 1 minus p squared. Why? Because each trial is independent. If there were dependencies, you could not write that. And now, knowing that, so what we have here is the likelihood of the data given a hypothesis a functional form. So now we need to maximize this. Well, basically we have to find the maximum likelihood estimate, maximum of the probability of the data given the hypothesis is simply max over all p, because p corresponds to a hypothesis, max over all p, p cubed times 1 minus p. Right. <coughs> so how do we learn? How do we solve this max? Would you directly take the derivative? Can you make your life easier? Take the log. Take the log because max of this is also, or arg max of this is the same as the arg max of log of this. And almost every time that we do this, we'll be taking, when we take the, we, in fact, I think in pretty much every case, instead of maximizing likelihood, we'll be maximizing the log likelihood because it just makes the calculus easier. So in general, let's say, you have uh, A successes and B failures. So instead of maximizing likelihood, we'll maximize the log likelihood. And this is something that you, know, you should be able to work out before I finish, come to the end of the slide. And if you take the derivative and set it to zero, and you don't even need paper to do that, you'll find that uh, the maximum of that function happens when the from when p is b divided by a plus b. So what is p? p is the probability of a failure, right? The probability of a failure is simply the number of failures divided by the total number of experiments. Number of failures in the, in, uh, the experiment that we had was 3, the number of experiments was 5. So probability of failure, the maximum likelihood estimate was 3 divided by 5. So what we just did is, here we have a learning algorithm, quote-unquote learning algorithm, uh, where we found the maximum likelihood estimate for this particular ex experiment. And the, there are two things that made this work. One, actually there are three things that made this work. 
The first one is that we are somehow hoping that the thing to do is maximum likelihood, which implicitly assumes that the prior is uniform. Every value of p is equally likely. I could have introduced a prior distribution, and uh, it turns out the right prior is the, for this case is the beta distribution, but we, can, we don't have to worry about that. I just made an assumption that the priors are all uniform. So that gives us maximum likelihood estimate. The second thing, the second assumption that we made is that this was a binomial trial. The probability of success is p. Basically, it's a coin toss. I could have invented or I could have assumed other probability distributions that predict success or failure for each experiment that might account for, I don't know, things like the weather on that day the experiment was conducted. So here we are saying that the probability of success is just a single number and we are trying to learn that. So that is the modeling assumption. And then the third assumption that we have is, oh, not the third assumption, the third uh, important uh, technical point here is that instead of maximum li maximizing the likelihood, we are just maximizing the log likelihood because it makes the math easier. And that's something that it has to become second nature to you. Every time you want to maximize likelihood, or most of the times you want to maximize likelihood, you should try to maximize log likelihood. So questions about this uh, kind of toy setting. So by the way, I just have to point out, those of you who said that the probability of failure was 0.6, in, inside, I mean, within your head, you basically ran a learning algorithm. You just didn't know. Questions? Yes? So in probabilistic learning, so the hypothesis space is really co uh, is come from the distribution you made first, right? Right. So v very often what we will do is we will assume a probabilistic function that assigns, say, pro uh, we'll assume that a probability function distribution that assigns probabilities to data points. Given any point, it should be able to say the probability of observing this data point is something. So given, say, for example, success, our distribution says the probability of success is 1 minus p. So you make that assumption. And it doesn't have to be that way, but that's the most common. Yeah. So does it classify things by assigning them a probability? Yeah, you could, either you could classify things by assigning them a probability, or you could just classify things. So what you, you're not really classifying by assigning a probability. What you're doing is uh, you could just classify by saying is the probability greater than half or something like that. Uh, or it's, is it more than some threshold? Is it more than some, you define a test. The most uh, reasonable test, the most common test is comparing to half. But that's how you classify. Yes? Can prior and log likelihood be different distributions? Yes. Yes, in fact, uh, very often they will. Uh, there's something, for, for here I assume that the likelihood, not the likelihood, but the probability of a data point is binomial. And the prior is uniform, but uniform is kind of, if you think about it, the uniform distribution over an infinite set assigns zero probability to everything. Uh, but it's an improper prior, we we'll just ignore that. But it's a different distribution. If you want to, uh, and I could have used a beta distribution here, and that will basically change when you, it doesn't matter, but they can be different distributions, yes. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, let's look at an interesting connection between maximum likelihood estimation and least squares regression. Remember least squares regression, we saw that many, many centuries back. Um, and it was uh, trying to predict whether we are not doing classification, we are trying to predict a real value out. So you are given some data point, the data point could be a vector, some d-dimensional vector, and you are asked to predict a real number. <coughs> regression could be used in, say, for example, um, a setting like, what is the value of the stock tomorrow? And things like that, rather than a classification. And we saw an algorithm for regression way back, 
around the time that we were looking at linear classifiers. And, we look, and let's revisit regression from the Bayesian perspective, or from the probabilistic point of view. So the first step that you need to do is we have the problem. We have the inputs and outputs. The inputs are vectors. The outputs are real numbers. What we need to do first is to come up with a generative story. A generative story is just a story of the data. How could, how could a training set be generated? And what we are going to assume is that a training example is simply uh, a pair, x, comma, y. And what we can assume is the input x, let's say, is picked at random. And there's some true function f that's applied to this input. So you apply that function and you get a real number because we are doing regression. And then on top of that, some noise is added. And that I'm calling that EI. So before we actually observe a training set, the true value is perturbed by some noise. And we'll assume that this noise is independent of the training examples and it comes from a Gaussian. And moreover, it has a, the mean of that, the noise is zero and it has some standard uh, deviation, some fixed standard deviation. Okay? So this is a generative story. You pick an example, apply a function, just smudge it around a bit with some noise, uh, Gaussian, and then that is what we observe. So our training set consists of many, many examples of this form. That's the assumption we are making. We have to make an assumption very often. In, in this in Bayesian modeling, we have to come up with first a generative story. Once we come up with that, once we have made an assumption, now we can start trying to explain how our training examples were generated. We have m examples, and we can start defining what is the probability, what is the likelihood of the data. So, just to summarize, just to mention, you know, make this slightly more formal, I'm assuming that the noise is Gaussian, <coughs> which means the difference of y comma f of x is zero mean uh, Gaussian, which is equivalent to saying that uh, the true value of the, uh, if, if the true function was h, then the probability of y given h is a Gaussian. So we are assuming that the errors are Gaussian. And basically what we have here is a, way of, is a probability of a particular data point xi, yi given an example, G sorry, given a hypothesis for some function. I don't know what the function is. The function, by the way, is not probabilistic. Pro function is any function. So we are assuming that the data is generated this way. And now we can just start thinking about maximum likelihood. Uh, we want to somehow, we want to estimate the likelihood of the data set. The data set consists of uh, m examples, x i, y i. Each of them is independent. So we can just represent the probability of the data set as the product of the probabilities of each example. That's just this step. And I'm assuming also that uh, the inputs are generated uniformly, so that can be factored out. So really, maximizing the likelihood of the data, given the hypothesis, is simply the same as maximizing <coughs> this quantity here. P, the product of P of yi given xh. Questions before we move ahead? In this case, yeah. And so, I mean, what would our, I mean, our hypothesis is going to be, um, I mean, I'm kind of looking at all of that's going to be like a straight line, basically. In, in, we are going to assume that in the next slide. But at this point, I've not made that assumption. Right. Here I'm saying that the hypothesis is some function, a fixed function. I mean, of a hypothesis space is a fixed set of functions. I don't care what, but deterministic. It's the noise that is the random variable. Yes, yeah, so it's the noise part. Like, we didn't have that before. Yes, yes, we did. Why, like, how, how does that fit into the picture? Uh, we'll see that in a minute. It turns out that uh, 
these squares actually is maintained as a notion. So we care about finding the <coughs> most likely hypothesis. We care about R max d given h. And what we just saw was because each training point is independent, we can ask what is the, the, the likelihood of the data is simply what the product of the probabilities of these individual data points. Right? This is the IID assumption. You have a question? Oh no, I had an edge. You had an edge, okay. <laughs> but we, because we made an assumption that uh, the noise is uh, coming from the Gaussian distribution, that's just literally plugging in what we had before. Just to remind you, this part here is this part here is the same as this, and that's the Gaussian distribution. Yes. So you actually mean density function. Right? Yes, yes, and that's why I used a lowercase p here. Yeah. <coughs> so now we have a function h. I mean, we have a a mathematical form for the likelihood of the data. And what we have to do is maximize the likelihood. And H figures on top right there. Sigma, let's assume, is a constant for now. Okay. So what we need to do next is maximize this function. How do we do that? Take log. Take log. Yes. You just, you have an nasty function, but that's a product of some exponents, exponential forms. We try to simplify this by taking log, and actually taking log takes brings us to a very, very convenient form. Uh, this part here comes from here, and this just becomes, the exponent just shows up inside the summation. That comes from here. Right? Now, the first term, the log of 1 over sig sigma root 2 pi, is independent of h. When I'm maximizing this summation, I can just drop the first term because it does not depend on h. So it's exactly the same as maximizing the negative sum of these square differences. So this, the denominator is positive. Right? And maximizing this quantity is, I have to somehow figure out how to get rid of this. I think by the end of the semester, I have to figure out how to get rid of the, the <coughs> pen stuff. Yes. So maximizing the negative sum is simply the same as minimizing uh, the sum. And <coughs> what we have here is the maximum likelihood estimate according to this particular model where we believe that the noise is Gaussian is simply the same as minimizing the sum of the squared errors. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first saw that, I was like totally blown away. This is so cool. When I introduced linear regression or any the regression model, I thought of it as, you know, let's, what do we care about? We care about not making too many mistakes. Let's define what's a mistake. A mistake is squared error and we try to minimize the mean squared error. And minimizing the mean squared error gives us some function. Here's a totally different way of coming to the same conclusion. Actually, when you're minimizing the mean squared error, what you're doing is pretending that the noise came, the, the, this whole, the, the data was generated with this particular noise model of Gaussian noise. And just the square part, oh, the square part here just shows up because there's a square in the Gaussian. So the most hy likely hypothesis here is simply the least square, um, least mean square hypothesis. Um, could you repeat how we removed the first term? The first term here, the sigma thing? Uh, the log sigma, yeah. Yes. So <coughs> notice that the maximization <coughs> here is happening over h. The first term is independent of h. It's a constant. So I'm adding, a, so think of it this way. The term inside the summation, or this entire summation, <coughs> is basically some score for every hypothesis. And you're adding a constant term to every hypothesis. It's independent of the hypothesis. It's like saying, what is the max 
between 0 and 1 of a plus x, where x goes from 0 to 1. The max changes, but the r max does not. That's why you can get rid of the first term. And we'll keep doing this very often in a lot of optimization. We'll keep doing this, uh, getting rid of these kinds of constants from optimization. Yes? Um, where did the assumption of the error distribution the, uh, the assumption of the error distribution takes us from here to here. We are assuming that the error, the difference of y comma x, or y comma h of x is Gaussian. Zero mean and some constant standard deviation. Oh, the noise is not always Gaussian, right? We are making that assumption. If the noise is not Gaussian, you have to basically plug in that. You have to make some other assumption, plug in that, and you'll get a different uh, estimate. And in fact, this is kind of convenient. And it's not assuming that the noise is Gaussian is not an outrageous assumption. Except you know, unless of course you know something else. I know unless you have you have some domain knowledge that explicitly says it should be something else. So what we have here is that the most likely hypothesis, the maximum likelihood estimate. I'm using H. ML and I'll keep using it throughout to denote the maximum likelihood uh, hypothesis. And what it is is it's basically some function. Sometimes it's, it can be just the parameters that define a function, like a weight vector. <coughs> In this case, it's some function. But if you believe that this, now we can make our hypothesis space assumption, if the hypothesis space was a set of linear functions, then you simply get y minus w transpose x squared uh, and sum of that minimize that summation and this is just the least mean square regression and we know algorithms for solving this in fact uh, I don't know if you remember this but uh, I asked you as an exercise to prove that this can be solved analytically and it can this actually be just boils down into a particular uh, matrix uh, problem. So th in this case, learning does not even need an algorithm. You can, it literally just requires taking an inverse of a cert certain matrix and multiplying. Questions about a, either maximum likelihood learning or Bayesian learning or the general scheme of things or least mean squares regression. Yes. Does that literally mean that uh, we take least squares as a uh, law function? We, we assume that uh, this is a uh, 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 what is a better is a what that distribution? I don't know. Gaussian. Yeah, Gaussian distribution. Well, you are. It turns out that they are equivalent. Uh, if, if we take another uh, law function, we will get another. Uh, yeah, actually, that's an interesting question. Uh, if you take another log function, does that always con uh, compare to, uh, you know, that, does that become a different, um, does every loss function correspond to a probabilistic assumption? Maybe. Uh, it, it, it has to be a valid probability distribution. Um, for example, instead of squared loss, if you assume that it was absolute value, for example, if the difference that you seek to minimize is the absolute value, then what you are actually minimizing, then the assumption actually is that the noise comes from a Cauchy distribution. Just so happens. I was from like a double exponential. Huh? I was double exponential, not Cauchy, and it's absolute value. I think it's Cauchy, but I could be wrong. <coughs> yeah, I should check. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so what we have here is a, another, we've been looking at basically recipes for writing down learning algorithms. One broad class of ways, uh, one broad techniques for inventing learning algorithms is to define a loss function and just minimize it. Here's another recipe. Make some assumption about a model that generates the data and then maximize the likelihood and see what comes up. And these recipes very often have a very interesting uh, 
merging point because uh, it turns out algorithmically one of them ends up being the same as another. Like assuming Gaussian noise becomes equivalent to least mean squares regression. <coughs> so let's change gears a little bit. So we've seen what is Bayesian learning. The general uh, the framework for it. And we've looked at a couple of examples. Uh, let's now come to the other question that was asked earlier. Why is maximum likelihood the right thing to do? Maybe this is just, you know, I'm just making it up. <coughs> it turns out, instead of thinking of the most likely or the most, uh, the, the map hypothesis, I could think of another kind of um, classifier. And this is called the most probable predictor, the most uh, probable classification. So far we've been asking what, given a particular data set, find the most uh, likely or the map classifier. But really, is that what we care about? Because the way it works is, you're given a data set, you find the most likely hypothesis, and then you throw away the data set, and now a new example comes in and we just make predictions using the fixed function. Once learning is done, once a maximum likelihood estimation is complete, you just have a fixed classifier, it's to go around making predictions. Another way of predicting is to say, instead of fixing the hypothesis up front, after the training examples come in, I keep my data, and when a new test example comes in, I ask what is the most probable label for this test example conditioned on the data set. Now, I want you to think about, is this the same uh, as the map or maximum likelihood uh, estimate? Are they the same? How many people say yes? One, there's one yes or one question. <coughs> one, yes. one yes. How many say no? There's one, two no's. Okay, <laughs> the, the map estimate here is, the most like, the maximum likelihood estimate is no. Uh, so, uh, let's, I'm going to argue that it's no, and, uh, let, uh, and I'll do that in a couple of uh, ways. One of them is just uh, in, to point out that we, the optimum prediction condition on the data set does not necessarily have to be the same as the optimum prediction or, or as the prediction of a fixed classifier. So, what I mean is, in the first case, so this is the first case and this is the second case. The first case what we do is you're given some data set, you convert it into some function. And what, the way you do it is through some say map or it could be map or maximum likelihood. And when a new example comes in, what you do is you just apply this function. In the second case, what you do is you have a data set, and what you ask is when a new example comes in, what's the probability of the label given the new example and the entire data set? And these two could be very, very different because this is simply the sum over all hypothesis, probability of y given h. So it's, this can be factorized into the sum of, you're basically marginalizing away all the hypotheses. And they could be different. Let me give you an example of why they could be different. Um, unless there are questions or suggestions, yes. Is this the same thing as um, like our having algorithm where we took the majority vote? Uh, not quite actually. This is, uh, after we spoke about the having algorithm, we spoke about a variant of that which talks about, uh, which is interactive. The name is totally slipping my mind right now, but uh, this is similar to that. I'll give you an example that uh, points this out, that explains this. Say we have only three functions, h1, h2, and h3. And for some data set, uh, the, pro the, the posterior probability of h1 is 0.4, the posterior probability of h2 is 0.3, and the posterior probability of h3 is also 0.3. What is the map hypothesis? 
H1. H1. Why? Because it has the highest posterior probability. So that's easy. Now let's say a new example comes in. It turns out for this particular example, H1 predicts a 1, H2 predicts minus 1, and H3 predicts minus 1. Now, I could ask, instead of the most maximum a posteriori hypothesis, so first of all, what is the prediction of the map hypothesis? <coughs> minus one. Plus, plus, plus one. The prediction of the map hypothesis, the map hypothesis is plus one, so it is plus one. Instead, I could ask, what's the probability of one given x? That is simply probability of one given some function h times probability of h given sorry. sum over, you just uh, marginalize all the hypothesis, ask what is the probability of the all the functions that predict, what's the total probability that uh, of one happening among all the functions that were considered. In this case, there's only one function that predicts one, and the total probability of one plus one showing up is 0.4. On the other hand, there are two functions that predict minus one and they have probabilities of 0.3 each, so the probability of minus 1 is actually 0.6. So it just so happens that the most probable prediction here is minus 1. But the prediction of the map classifier is plus 1. And these two things are different. They could be different. I'm not saying they are always going to be different. Here's an example where they are different. But here you are combining H2 and H3. Uh, what if H2 and H3 are highly similar? Then so they predict the same. Sure, but the probability of H we don't care. We are not asking what the similarities of these functions are. We are just saying, what, in fact, the expression that we are using is simply probability of we we have a uh, an unknown. So when we are thinking about probability of some say y given x comma data set, we do not have, the only quantity that we have is the following, probability of y given h1 and a data set, well, probability of let's say plus 1. Probability of plus 1 given h1 is 1, right? h1 always predicts 1 according to this here. Probability of plus one given H two for an example for that example is zero because H two just predicts minus one and similarly for H three so probability of y given x and b is probability of y given H H one and x times probability of H one given b plus probability of y given h2 comma x times probability of and so on. So, and which basically we are asking for this majority prediction or not majority but this voted prediction of all classifiers where the vote is the posterior probability of that classifier. Okay? And this is a constructed example that points out that map estimate does not have to be, does not have to agree with the most probable label. Now, it turns out this kind of a classification called Bayes optimal classification, which simply says what is the most, the, the label of the most, the most probable label is, uh, in Bayes optimal classifier, class <coughs> predicting a Bayes optimal classifier <coughs> is impossible. Well, not impossible, but practically uh, intractable. Because you have to, for every example, when a new example comes in, you basically have to take a vote from every function in the hypothesis space. And clearly, when you have infinite hypothesis spaces, it's not a sum anymore, it's an integral. 
and it becomes uh, intractable unless you have a very very uh, simple hypothesis space or a very uh, often uninteresting class of functions. But it turns out that the Bayes optimal classifier is the best classifier for any particular hypothesis space. On an average, this cannot be outperformed by any classifier. Okay? So, we would like to have this function. Unfortunately, we just can't compute it. So, what we do is basically pretend that in the map, map style of learning, we pretend that the entire probability mass is placed on the map hypothesis and all other functions are uh, impossible. And we just use that one function to make a prediction. Yes? Is there like a variant where you use as many <coughs> hypotheses as you can? Yeah, in fact, uh, I don't know if they have names for these, but uh, th that's often done. And it's kind of, you can, if you think of it, it's a style of ensemble where you take votes effectively from multiple uh, classifiers. So I'm still having a hard time understanding like why. So are these all these hypotheses like trained in some way on the data set? No, we do, we're never doing any training. When a new example comes, so what we are effectively doing is when the data set comes in, we are computing all the posterior probabilities, all the probability of h given x, let's say, and we just keep them in memory. And now when a new example comes in, we compute the summation. Every function has some say on what the label should be. And every, that function is voted, I mean, gets a vote which is equal to its uh, posterior uh, probability. You might be able to posterior probability. P of h given d. Probability of hypothesis given a data set. Is the probability of correct hypothesis given a data set? No, just probability that this is the hypothesis given the data set. So, the posterior probability, I'll come to you in a minute. So, this quantity here for any function is the posterior probability. So, probability yes, of h <coughs> d is, is the posterior distribution which is proportional to probability of and this is how we came up with the map uh, rule. So, if you want to do base optimal classification, what you should do is when the data set is given to you, you first somehow tabulate the posterior distributions, posterior probability for every hypothesis in your hypothesis space. And then when a new example comes in, ask each of these functions, what do you think the label is? That's something, that's this quantity. And give it a weight which is equal to the posterior, that's the thing in the box. And now take this average across the entire hypothesis space, and that's the prediction. So, uh, when, when you say no other method can beat this, this is including like, is that within this way of thinking of a problem, or is that, you know... No, this is the optimal classifier. Even, you know, in like the pack learning Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sense. Right. Uh, this is the, uh, basically this is the classifier that has, uh, in fact, this, the base optimal classifier, the error of the base optimal classifier is called the base risk, or the base optimal error. And very often, this is this forms a theoretical uh, best that this hypothesis space can do for a given set of assumptions. So when you said uh, we are actually com computing uh, the weight for every uh, hypo I mean, hypothesis on the set, and it's impossible to compute. So you said we are considering uh, the uh, post posterior. Uh, probability for the map hypothesis. So, how can that be the best possible No, it's not. What we would like is this. Okay. Instead, we approximate this summation by pretending that the entire probability mass, P of H, is placed on this one hypothesis, which is the map hypothesis. So, we only keep track of that one function. So, for example, if I think of problem, let's say we have, again going back to the uh, example that we had, let's say we had three functions, h1, h2, and h3. So you have h1, h2, and h3. And on this axis, I'm just plotting the posterior 
problems. Let's say H1 is this, H2 is this, and H3 is this. So this is 0.4, let's say this is 0.3, and this is also 0.3. Now, if I want to take the Bayes optimal prediction, what I need to do is have, take the expected uh, label across this space. Instead, what I the map prediction can be seen as an approximation, as a computational um, uh, computational uh, shortcut, or a, a sort of a way of avoiding this intractability by pretending that this, the max one, has the full probability mass. So it's really we are saying that this is one, and it's two, and it's three, have zero probability. If all the probability mass was placed on the most likely, the most uh, probable classifier, then the Bayes optimal simply goes down to whatever the prediction of H1 is. So we, have, we want to solve, we want to use this distribution and take the weighted average prediction. We don't have, we can't do that, so we instead we just put all the weight on this one classifier, the map classifier. That's one way of thinking about maximum a posteriori learning, and that's one way of justifying map learning. Does that sort of resolve your question? Map, the term map and maximum likelihood are the same. No, map is maximum a posteriori, so Maximum a posteriori is simply asking what's the uh, arg max of the posterior distribution. Maximum likelihood assumes that this quantity here is uniform, is independent of h. So every function is equally likely, so it gets taken out of the arg max. Maximum likelihood is maximum a posteriori with an assumption. Other questions? Yes. So how can you calculate the P H given D? P of H given D, we can't calculate it. So that's why we uh, we uh, we, do, we don't calculate it. We just ask for what P of H given D is proportional to P of D given H times P of H. And our model, remember, for example, in the um, what do you call it? The example that you saw with the, uh, the say the beads and stuff. Probability of data given the hypothesis is simply probability of each example given the hypothesis. So we can calculate P of T given H once we have the model. And we can make an assumption about P of H. So you just make an assumption that. Yeah. So we assume that the hypothesis functions have certain distribution. We have to. We need a, we need P of H is basically a probability distribution over functions. P of D given H is a probability distribution over examples given the function. Yes? So, um, I may be wrong, but it seems like we never actually run the data through the hypothesis like we're used to. Like, like we're, we're not... During learning or prediction? Like we're not, we're not, like if we're trying to find a linear classifier, mm -hmm. we're not finding W for each hypothetical possible linear classifier, right? Because every so W corresponds to one linear classifier. Yeah. So I, I didn't understand your question. So I'm I'm confused because it seems like we're we're test we're going through all of the possible hypotheses, right? Right. So but it's where's the step where we like run all of our data and right. try to so, run it through that one Yes, one and that, that shows up inside the algorithm that actually exists that finds this artifacts. Because this P of D, when you are, because you assume that each example is independent, P of D becomes a product of probabilities of example given the hypothesis. And then typically, uh, when you take the log and you know you get some objective function that you want to optimize, the optimization algorithm will internally run through every example and do such things. At a at a broader level, 
both of these, the Bayesian and the risk minimization style learning, are still search over hypotheses. In both cases, we are inventing functions that we think will rank better hypotheses, either higher or lower, depending on whether you are maximizing or minimizing. Actually, in all cases, we are hoping that we will find a, we are trying to invent a function that ranks better hypotheses <coughs> higher. Internally, in solving this argmax, you might have to run through the data multiple times and such things. And when we see the example for naive base, for example, it, for na in fact, naive base is kind of an interesting case where it doesn't have to run through the data. Because it, this argmax, it turns out, for naive base can be just solved on paper. And uh, so you really don't even have to run through data. For logistic regression, we'll do a similar sort of a thing, but then come to a problem that is intractable. Uh, I mean, not intractable, but not analytically solvable. So then we have to run through ex each example and do some gradient uh, descent or something like that. Is this maximum likelihood uh, expression in do we have this kind of norm that prevents overfitting? Right, so that shows up in the, if P of H, basically that shows up in how you define P of H. If, for example, there's a, this is a product of two terms, the likelihood, maximum likelihood does not have easily a knob that fits, uh, controls overfitting. Map on, the, map on the other hand does. It's a product of two terms. One that's just a function of data. The other one that's just a function of functions, of the hypothesis. If the likelihood, the first term, probability of data given the hypothesis dominates this, and then you will pick a function that uh, ends up overfitting. So there, there is a knob. Basically, if this is a, in, in this case, we are in the product space. But when we take a sum, this becomes log likelihood plus log prior. Right? And we can add a, a constant that. Uh, that trades off, and that just changes the probability distribution. <coughs> that, that changes the prior distribution, actually. <coughs> Other questions? So, let's look at a couple of, uh, at least one important class of uh, uh, examples where this idea of Bayesian learning can be applied and you know I can work it out entirely on the board. It might be a little painful, but I can, I can work it out. So it's one of those somewhat simple classifiers which has some very interesting properties. So given that there are 10 minutes left, I'll probably just introduce naive base and without uh, getting into actually the details of how to train a classifier. But we have to kind of do a slightly, uh, a bit of a mental switch, uh, turn off a mental switch here, which is, we've seen Bayesian learning. We've seen how uh, we come up with a probabilistic criterion for ranking functions. <coughs> and we've, that gives us, you know, maximum a posteriori and ma maximum likelihood learning. And one thing you should be very, very comfortable with, uh, maybe not right now, but going ahead, is uh, this difference between these two things, the difference between map and maximum likelihood. Just to remind you, maximum likelihood is exactly the same as map learning, except you assume that the priors are uniform. So map is asking what, uh, for a hypothesis that maximizes the product of the likelihood and the prior. And if the priors are all uniform, then it does not change the maximum, the maximizer so your simply maximum likelihood estimate is simply asking for <coughs> the hypothesis that maximizes the likelihood of the data. So this is for any class of functions, for any hypothesis space. What if the hypothesis itself was a class of functions that predicted probabilities? So now we can not only learn probabilistic classifiers, we can also make probabilistic predictions. Okay? And I think someone pointed this out I, about how are we predicting probabilities here? We don't have to. In the least squares, we did not, but we could. These functions could also be uh, probabilistic. 
in nature. So we are learning a probabilistic function using a probabilistic criteria. So the function that we are, once we get a function, so let me give an example. This gives us again max map prediction. What we care about is for a particular example. Here the random variables are no longer data sets and uh, classifiers. We are just looking at an example. Say for example, x could be, I don't know, a, a, in a feature vector. It could be, uh, say, a fish that you want to classify as something or something else. And y is a label. Is the fish dead or alive? <laughs> and what you are asking is, what is the probability of the label taking some value? And these are random variables, and we can do the same thing again. We can apply Bayes' rule. So, if we care about the posterior probability of the label being certain label y for a particular input, we know that the Bayes' rule tells us that this posterior probability is simply proportional to the product of the prior probability of the label. Most fish are probably dead. So, pro uh, so the prior would bias uh, the one label might bias you towards one label or another before you even see the example. And the likelihood is asking what is the probability that the fish looks like this when it's alive or when it's dead. So that's your likelihood. And so we can now predict as uh, using, we can make a map prediction. Here I'm assuming that we have some functions that give us these probabilities. Those functions are the hypotheses. So, uh, once again we play the same game, the denominator is really uh, independent of the thing that we are maximizing over, so we don't care about p of x, so we can just draw that out. So, map prediction, not map learning, functionally looks very similar. We are asking what is the prior, the posterior probability of a label for a particular example, and we want to find the label that maximizes this. And that's exactly the same as finding a label that maximizes the product of the likelihood and the prior. And this is called wave map prediction. And I want you to, you know, just clarify, keep these two things as separate concepts in your head. There is map prediction and there's map learning. Map prediction is when you predict using a probabilistic classifier. Map learning is when you learn a function using a probabilistic criteria. They look kind of disconcertingly similar. It looks like I just changed the symbols and that's because in both cases we are using the same principle. We are using Bayes' rule in both cases. So just to uh, set this up, we care about finding a label that has the highest posterior probability and that's just the product of these two quantities. So all we need now in order to make this prediction happen is these two sets of probabilities. We need some functions that gives us the likelihood and the prior. So, yes? So is that possible that I mean that we can predict the value? If, yeah sure, if you have these functions, if somehow you knew these probabilities, then why do you need to learn? You can think of learning as the process of determining these probabilities. Yes? Can we keep math prediction uh, until next week? I mean, you want to separate math learning and math prediction heads, so... Uh, we will unfortunately have to keep it for next week. Uh, but I do want to introduce the idea of probabilistic classifiers. Yeah. I know, it's a little, uh, it, I, I understand that it can be an overload of rough, of very similar sounding things. Because the terms that you are saying is... Yeah, in both cases you have priors, in both cases you have likelihoods, and actually, in fact, that's why you were asking, what does it mean to be Bayesian? This is what it means to be Bayesian. Uh, you just have probabilities on top of probabilities on top of probabilities. Uh, you know, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, so, uh, in this case, for example, we are saying what is, when we talk about likelihood, when we talk, when we are talking about map learning, when we talk about likelihood, it's the likelihood of a data set given a function. 
what is the probability of what's the probability that this particular function produces this data? Okay, map prediction is asking in, in map prediction the likelihood is what is the probability that this particular label produced these features? That's your likelihood term here. In map learning, the prior is asking, even before I see any data, what is my prior belief over the class of functions? In map prediction, the prior is asking, before I see this particular example, what is my prior belief over the labels? So map learning is basically playing the game of probabilities over functions. Map prediction is playing the same game over labels. Now, if you think they are complicated, we are going to basically put them together. Naive base, we are going to use not map but maximum likelihood learning to learn the classifier that does maximum a posteriori prediction. It may seem ridiculously convoluted, but it turns out the learning algorithm is incredibly simple. When you do this whole complicated you know, running around the block and coming back, you'll come back to a learning algorithm that you could have written down without knowing any of these things. But we'll see that uh, in the next week. I just want to set this up because the point of learning these things, as, uh, you po as was pointed out, if there was some magic uh, procedure that just gave me functions <coughs> that produce probabilities over labels and instances given a label, then I don't need to learn. So learning is simply that magic box. For now, pretend that learning is done. Let's start thinking about how many such numbers exist for a problem. Let's go back to this example that we had long, long back when we were talking about decision trees, about tennis, and just try to think of a probabilistic version of that game. We want to predict whether you know, I should play tennis or not. And the prior says, what is the probability that I should play tennis in the absence of any other information? And it's basically just two numbers, probability of yes or no. Okay. The likelihood is asking, on days that I play tennis, the top part here, on days that I actually do play tennis, what is the probability that the temperature is hot and <coughs> the wind is strong? Or what is the probability that the temperature is cold and the wind is strong on days that I play tennis. Similarly, on days that I don't play tennis, I'm asking what's the probability of all these things. The first term on the first box on top gives me the likelihood, and the second box gives me uh, sorry, first box gives me the priors, and these two at the bottom are examples of the likelihood. Now we can use these to make a map prediction. Suppose on a particular day, the temperature is hot and the wind is uh, weak. And the question is, should I play tennis? So what we are asking is really, probability of play <coughs> given hot and uh, the wind, when the temperature is hot and the wind is weak. Actually, no, we are asking for R max. Over this rank of over the states that the play can take, and uh, what we know is that it's simply the product of the likelihood and the prior and prediction. In fact, this is where I should probably introduce this word called inference. Inference is simply another name for prediction. Inference is done by asking, trying out all possible values of the output. So probability of, let me just erase this so that it looks a little cleaner. You, the output can take two values, yes or no. You try both of those out, plug that in, into the product of the likelihood of, the likelihood of the observation, your current observation, whatever state it is today, given yes, times your prior belief, yes. And that gives you the some number. And you try the same thing for no probability of the observation, given that tennis is not played, times the probability that the prior probability of not playing tennis, that gives you another number. And you just compare these things, and the R max is simply yes. What we have done here is basically map prediction. We have 
computed the uh, term that's proportional to the posterior probability of every possible outcome. Here there are only two outcomes. And found the one that is the most, uh, has the highest value. It's really just saying like, how well do these inputs fit this statement? Yeah. Yeah, that's the uncharitable way of saying this. That's the kind of very unromantic way of looking at Bayesian uh, uh, predictions. But yes, you're right. Is this over fit or under fit? Oh, at this point, there's no fitting, right? Learning is done. We have all the parameters. There's no fitting. Overfitting and underfitting are problems with learning. Here we have finished learning, some magic box has given us all these probabilities and now all we have to do is make predictions. And what we have done is map prediction. Alright, I'm going to stop now, I'm a minute over time. Uh, we're going to pick this up in the next class and most likely all of next class will be naive based classification. And I understand this is not the most obvious thing to look at because the terms are so confusing. So just go over these slides and come ready with questions. <coughs>